welcome back. And today we're back to working on the Bendix G15. This is a full-fledged vacuum tube computer from 1956. If we can get it up and going, it may very well be the oldest running digital computer in North America. That's pretty exciting. But uh, how did it get here and who on earth entrusted me with such an amazing piece of history? Well, this one is on loan from Bob over at System Source Museum. And if you haven't heard of System Source Museum, go check them out immediately. They have one of the greatest collections of vintage computing hardware out there. And what's even better is that a lot of it actually works, like the PDP-8 that they let me actually toggle stuff into. That was so much fun. So definitely come to System Source Museum, and there's no better time to do it than May 17th. That is an open house that we're working on setting up. And and I am gonna be there. But also, I think we might be doing something with the original Apple One that they have there. Yeah, by the way, they have an original Apple One. No promises, that's all still very much so in the works, but either way, it's gonna be a ton of fun. So come to the open house and hang out with Bob and everybody and me. But uh, the G15 that's on display there is very different from the G15 that is here. And this one is very close to running. In the previous episodes, we took a look at all of the cards. They all seem to be in excellent shape. We uh, did a whole lot of cleaning and we ran into the biggest problem yet, which was the drum. The original drum that was in this machine was crashed, but the one that's on display at System Source Museum had a drum that wasn't crashed. And that's the drum that is currently in here. We did a drum swap and we actually got the AC spun up. In this machine, power comes up in stages. The first stage is bringing up the AC. What this does is it spins up the rotating drum memory and it turns on the filaments for all of the vacuum tubes. It also turns on all of the cooling fans. And we were able to see that the drum has a good clock track and a good timing track on it. That means that we are a go for hitting the big green button right here, which turns on DC. But there is one more thing that we really need to tackle before we turn on DC, and that is the typewriter right here. Now the typewriter is in a very interesting thing, and the the way it communicates with the Bindix is strange. Nobody's ever done it quite like this, I think. So let's pull the typewriter out, take a look at exactly what it's doing, get it nice and clean, and maybe we can ensure that whenever we plug this into the Bindix and we turn on the AC that the typewriter is going to work. And then we're clean, good to go to push the DC in the next episode, I'm thinking. So we got a ton of work. Let's just hop to it. This is, for all intents and purposes, an IBM electric typewriter. It even says IBM right here on the back. And as far as I'm aware, if we put 120 volts into the main motor on this, it'll spin up and work just like a normal typewriter. Press a key, it punches a letter onto the paper. Except there's a couple of big glaring differences. The first is this insane platen. This is a 28 inch platen. This is the only Bendix typewriter I've seen that happens to have this large platen. Most of the other pictures and typewriters that I've seen that go with the G15 have a much shorter platen. And at first I, I hated this thing because it takes up so much space in the room because you have to ensure that you have enough room for the platen to swing all the way to the left and all the way to the right. <laughs> It's so big. <laughs> but it's starting to grow on me, if I'm being honest. How often do you get to play around with a typewriter that has a 28 inch platen? This is awesome. But that's not the only big change. This thing does have to plug into a Bendix and it has to receive data from the Bendix and send data to the Bendix. Now the Bendix is interesting and uh, if we read the manual right here, it says the input output system of the G15D may almost be considered an independent data processing system. Its logical linkage to the computer proper is very loose. Anytime data is leaving the system, whether it's to go to the typewriter or to the magnetic tape or to the tape reader or anything like that, it goes into its own kind of separate computer within a computer. 
So that means that the input output system is communicating with those peripheral devices in a very specific way. And with the typewriter, it's communicating using five bits. Now five bits is an interesting number because teletypes also use five bits. So here we are with a typewriter that has a full keyboard and we're sending five bit of data back and forth. Makes perfect sense to use Badeau because you can type the entire alphabet using those five bits, but nope. Bindix doesn't do that. They do something a little different with their five bits. Whenever data is going back and forth between the computer, it's really sending four bits plus a command bit. If bit five here is a zero, then it is a command bit, which means that we're sending a space, a minus, a carriage return, tab, end stop, reload, period, wait. And actually, if it's a command, that fourth bit is completely superfluous. It's ignored. But if that fifth bit is set to a one, then the four bits are a value. And this is a hexadecimal value representing zero through 15. Now in traditional hexadecimal, when you get to nine, instead of wrapping back around to zero and writing 10, you write A, because A equals 10, B equals 11, C equals 12, and so on. But Bindix, again, doesn't do that. Instead, they go with U. So U equals 10, V is 11, W is 12, X is 13, Y is 14, Z is 15. Why does Bindix use U through Z for hexadecimal? I don't know, you'd have to ask them because it doesn't make any sense to me, but it is unique for sure. <laughs> So we have a five bit signal going back and forth that is sending either a hexadecimal value or a command of some type. But there's also some extra stuff going on beyond that. So if we look at this page right here, so zero through nine and U through Z are highlighted in black on this image. And then all of the keys that are highlighted in gray are something else. Uh, so for example, P is a photo tape read and it sets communication lines 23 and N to zero. So we have all of these additional keys that are sending specific commands to the input output system within the Bindix. So each one of those keys needs to have a separate way to communicate with the Bindix. And I believe they're doing that by wiring them up independently. We also have these three switches on the bottom here. We have enable, punch, and compute. And enable is pretty simple, it's either on or off. And all this does is enable or disable the typewriter from sending something to the Bindix. And this is so that you can have a particularly long program running, doing some pretty heavy computation, and you can't accidentally knock, knock something over that falls into the keyboard and stops your program so you have to start over from scratch. Punch here turns the punch on the main machine on or off, I believe. So that way you can control the punch on the machine remotely from the typewriter without having to get up and walk over to it. And then finally, here we have compute. In the center section, this is halt. The machine is halted, it's not doing anything. If we flip it over to go, the machine just starts executing code and runs. And the only thing that can halt it is a physical halt command. If you flip it over to BP, it goes and runs just like normal, but a breakpoint can also halt the computer. So you have two methods of operation that you can do depending on where this switch on the front is. So that is our typewriter, I guess. It's pretty filthy and um, the keys seem completely locked up. So we're probably gonna have to take this pretty far apart. Anything that looks like it needs oil is gonna get oil. Anything that looks like it needs cleaning is gonna get heavy duty cleaning. And uh, hopefully by the end of this, we should have a functioning typewriter. I don't know if it'll be a functioning terminal until we plug it into the Bendix and put some power into it. But first, Let's get this thing clean and looking nice. First things first, let's get the front cover off. After flipping open the access panel, we can get to the two long bolts that hold it in place. And with those removed, the whole thing just pops right off, giving excellent access to the hammers. Next, let's try to get the platen out. After flipping open the side panel, a little locking lever can be twisted to release the platen. With both left and right locking levers released, the hilariously long platen pulls straight up and out. Below the platen is the little metal paper guide that prevents the paper from getting caught up in the inner workings. To get the ribbon out, there are these little locking tabs that hold the ribbon wheels in place. Pull them loose and the ribbon wheel can slip up out the top. Then it's just a matter of unthreading the ribbon from the mess of guides and tensioners. And while doing this, I noticed that one of the ribbon tensioner springs had come loose. So before I forget, I wanna go ahead and get that back in place. 
Now let's start getting as many panels off for cleaning as possible, starting with this platen cover panel. Then the keyboard cover panel is just pushed onto little grommets and it just pulls straight up and off. Finally, I want to try and get the bottom panel off, so I'll just tip the machine onto its back and it looks like the bottom is held on with four little rubber feet that screw into place. With all four removed, the bottom panel is free to swing down and give access to the madness within. All right, I gotta take a quick break from the uh, voiceover disassembly montage that's going on there and just talk about this, because this is epic. This is what enables the Bendix to do Bendixy things with just an average run-of-the-mill IBM electric typewriter. This entire PCB down here has a boatload of germanium diodes on it, and it's been pretty heavily modified, it looks like. We have uh, three, at least three resistors here that have been list lifted. There's a couple of diodes here that have bypass wires on them, just essentially shorting across the diode, which is a really interesting thing to do. We have a bunch of solenoids in here and in here. Then we have two huge plugs that go up to the collection of madness that is up top here. Now I'm doing a whole lot of guesswork here because this is my first time ever seeing this, but I'm thinking that behind this big metal plate here are the actual individual solenoids that will type for you. So they'll take some input from the Bendix, decode it to whatever specific thing they're trying to type, and then pull the equivalent letter. Now below that we have all of these switches here, and I think these are uh, just little contact switches that are sitting on the levers. So whenever you press a key, it makes contact down here, and then that contact sends a signal all the way out the plug and out the front. But that's a whole lot more than uh, just, you know, 16 for a value. There's a bunch of other stuff going on as well, which lines up with the individual commands that we were seeing. This is absolutely mental, and I love every bit of it. I'll start by giving everything a shot with the air compressor. For those of us that use computers regularly, we know all too well how filthy a keyboard can get. Well, this is essentially the same thing only after nearly 70 years. The air compressor did a great job of removing the bulk of the nastiness though. Then it's just a matter of putting in the work. To clean the keycaps, I just scrubbed them by hand with a simple green soaked shop cloth. I was afraid to try to remove them for fear of breaking the plastic. Then the rubber paper guide wheels were positively gross, but I didn't want to use a cleaner that may cause the rubber to deform or slip or swell up, so instead I just used a water soaked shop cloth and scrubbed like crazy. I also went through with a toothbrush to get into as many nooks and crannies as I could. Then I tilted the machine onto its back and got to work on the bottom, cleaning as much of the linkage as I could get to and giving the friction wheel a good scrub down. Finally, my big worry is getting the carriage moving smoothly. I slid it lock to lock and tried to clean the rails as much as possible, and finally I slipped a tiny bit of wheel bearing grease onto the rails so the bearings could pick it up. I'm not quite done cleaning yet, uh, but I think I've got it far enough that I want to give it a cursory test. I don't have the platen or ribbon or anything in there, so I'm not going to try and type anything. Uh, mostly I just want to see if I can get this carriage to move back and forth. I've greased up the rails a bit, uh, but I want to get it moving back and forth a little bit to kind of distribute that grease onto the bearings that are in there. I do know that I need to get AC into this because it's just a standard AC motor on there. The rest of the DC and uh, diodes and stuff, we don't particularly care about. We just want to get the mechanical bit working. And to get AC into it, uh, I pulled up the this page out of the manual here. This has the pinout of the 37 pin Canon connector that goes to the back of the Bendix. And we can see that on pins 35 and 36 is 115 volt AC. And I have confirmed that with the multimeter that that goes to the on off switch that's in the back here. So uh, if we flip this, AC should make it to the electric motor and things should start happening. Uh, <laughs> oh man. All right, I have absolutely no idea what's gonna happen. Uh, let's just do it. Well, the carriage moved just a little bit. The motor is moving. It sounds really good. Let's uh, hit tab. Oh, the carriage is so slow.
Almost. There it goes. <laughs> that was ridiculous. <laughs> oh, there we go. The carriage is a little sticky, but uh, for the most part, it seems to be moving back and forth somewhat. Okay, I need to work on that and see if I can free that up better and get it essentially just moving back and forth really easily. I spent the last three hours pouring over this thing, trying to lubricate everything, thinking that maybe the carriage was just still a little sticky, but it just wasn't right. It wasn't, something was fundamentally wrong here. Uh, and finally, I lifted it up and I looked in through the bottom and I could see that the belt that pulls the carriage this way and connects to the carriage return spring on the bottom uh, was it had slipped off of its roller and it was rubbing up against the frame and so that was just causing all sorts of problems. I couldn't get any video of it because it's deep inside the center of the system and I was just able to get my fingers in there, loosen it up and get it back onto the roller and uh, check this out. I've got all of the tab spots turned up so a tab should go pretty much to lock here. And yeah, there we go. And then if I hit a carriage return, that is crazy. We'll do it one more time. Absolutely bonkers, but working perfectly. Let's get the rest of it cleaned up so we can get it all back together. The outer pieces are thankfully intact without any cracks or breaks, but they are positively filthy. I scrubbed and scrubbed on this back panel, but after 70 years of grubby hands, some of that grime just isn't coming off. Still, it cleaned up decently well and looks a treat once back in place. Next, the keyboard surround panel actually cleaned up remarkably well, so the different materials and paints are scrubbing up wildly different. Either way, it looks magnificent once slid back into place around the now clean keycaps. For the front casing, I took it outside and scrubbed it more seriously. Then it got a solid spray down with the hose and that made a massive difference. After drying it thoroughly and slotting it into place, it looks stunning. Finally, let's get the platen section back together. Starting with the platen itself, this thing is comically long. But like before, I'm just using a water-soaked shop cloth and a lot of elbow grease. Getting it back into position is a funny kind of struggle. It's so long, it's hard to judge how centered you are. Finally, let's slip that platen cover back on and yeah, that's looking minty fresh. All right, it's uh, all back together and it looks absolutely stunning. This thing cleaned up beautifully well. Uh, but I have no idea if it'll actually type any characters. I have yet to push a key on here with a piece of paper in it. So let's go ahead and flip the power switch on here. The motor has spun up. Uh, <laughs> here goes nothing. Well, the hammers swing, but I don't hear them hitting the platen. I would have expected a lot more noise out of that and we're not getting anything printed on the paper. Could just be that something's not quite adjusted right and the hammers aren't making it all the way to the platen. And I think it was indeed a simple adjustment. This little lever on the far right here was set all the way to F. I've moved it over to A and I think we might actually get something here. So <laughs> here goes nothing. H E L L O R L D. The H was a little light. But look at that, hallorled. It prints, that's awesome. The hammer mechanism on this thing is absolutely bananas. There's a friction roller, which is essentially like another platen that sits underneath the chassis. And uh, whenever you press a key, it pushes these little serrated feet into that friction roller. And because that roller is constantly spinning, when the foot touches it, it slings that foot out the back. And that's what throws the hammer towards the paper. Of course, that only carries the hammer about halfway towards the paper and the momentum of the hammer needs to carry it the rest of the way. And that leads into an interesting issue that we're having with this machine and that the lowercase letters don't all print fine, but the uppercase do. You can see that when I try to type the quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog, which exercises every key on the keyboard, when it's in lowercase, some letters don't show up. Notably, the T is missing. But when I switch it over to uppercase, 
all of the letters now show up. All of the letters now type correctly. And that's really curious because a lowercase t and an uppercase t are on the exact same hammer. So why is one working when the other isn't? And I think it has to do with placement. When you're in lowercase, the uh, mechanism that holds all of the hammers sits a little higher. And when you switch to uppercase, it pulls that entire mechanism down low. And I think that's causing the hammer to get better aligned with the curvature of the platen. So there might be some adjustment that needs to be done here to get lowercase to better align with the platen. But uh, that's starting to get a bit beyond my skill set. I mean, I can bring mechanical things back to life, but getting them tuned precisely requires a special skill set that I haven't quite cultivated yet. But I happen to know somebody who is very well versed in teletypes and typewriters and all manner of electromechanical things. He also happens to own a uh, metal shop. So you know who you are. When we get you down here to the ranch someday, I'm gonna put you to work getting this Bendix typewriter tuned perfectly. But for now, I think this is gonna work excellently because even if the hammer doesn't strike the platen and type the letter, the uh, switches inside of there will have detected the key press and that'll send the correct signal to the Bendix. So the typewriter is functioning well enough for us to bring DC up on the Bendix and start testing and running things from there, which is hopefully what we're gonna do in the next episode. Now that episode isn't gonna happen immediately because we've got a pretty big event coming up. VCF East is coming up in just a couple of weeks. If you're available, come hang out with us in New Jersey. I'll be up there and uh, I think we're even gonna pull an old Hawk drive out of a Triad mini computer that they have up there and get to work bringing it back to life on the Sunday of that event. So come hang out for the weekend, especially show up on Sunday. I'll be working on stuff. If you can't make it to VCF East, definitely try to make it to the open house at System Source in Maryland. If you're available, come hang out at the events. It'll be absolutely epic. In the meantime, I want to thank you all so much for watching, and I hope to see you in the next episode.